Welcome to your weekly Social Jack Influence Factory. Introducing your coaches, Dean Delisle, Kate Hassett, and Jackson Delisle. Hey, hey, team, what's happening? Hey, hey what's up? How's it going? <laughs> Welcome to the program. Yes. Influence Factory. <laughs> right on, right on. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Influence Factory. And we are all together this time uh, live uh, from the Chicago studio. Uh, so welcome to all of you out there wherever you are. Uh, we have an exciting guest today. We're going to be talking about marketing and blockchain and uh, uh, exciting because it's a whole new revolution and uh it's uh, sort of taken taken a wave or taken uh, taken by storm the different uh ways that we're going to interact with marketing so uh for those of us uh, hey shirley how you doing uh those of us that uh want to engage with uh the social team kate where do people go yeah, so we'll be live tweeting this whole program. Make sure you check us out on Twitter. Follow Get Social Jack and the hashtag Influence Factory. Um, we have Jen there answering your questions and getting them to um, Corey or to Dean or to the panel. So make sure you check that out. And then we're also on every social media channel. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, um, obviously Twitter at Social Jack. So make sure you follow us. Yeah, right on, right on. All right, so those of you that uh, are new, we'd like to welcome you onto the program. Uh, so uh, we are using the GoToWebinar platform. There is a mobile app version. Uh, you can also, if you just want to take us on complete mobile and not wait for the podcast, you simply uh, click on or check your email and there will be, uh, if you click on, um, I think it's a uh, uh, phone call, you will get an actual number and access code, and you can jump right in and listen to us on the road. Uh, please do not watch uh, while driving, uh, so uh, we'll give that public service announcement. And Jackson, after the program, where can they pick this podcast up? Yeah, for sure. They, uh, uh, You can download it on uh, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and then you can also watch the recording after the fact on YouTube. Wow, all kinds of options. And beyond that, uh, you can also pick it up from the Social Jack Resource Center, along with a lot of links and items and downloads and whatever else we cover on the program. Uh, so with that being said, we always ask a question. Um, so, uh, so just curious to the audience, um, so a lot of us have had pets over our lifetime and some of us have pets now. So uh, what what was or what is your favorite pet? What kind of animal? What's the name of the animal and the animal? So Kate, you have to choose. Oh my gosh, but they're not listening, are they? <laughs> they listen to the podcast all the time. Um, <laughs> I have a cat and a dog, which everybody finds so funny because apparently you can only be a cat person or a dog person. So I couldn't choose between them. But um, the dog that I had as a child, I probably have like some of my most fondest memories of his name was Macintosh and he was a quiche so a big fluffy dog. Um, and so, you know, that's the dog that taught me responsibility and, you know, how to play nice with others. So I'm going to vote for him. There you go. And just to know, folks, we have Tracy chiming in and a few others. Uh, this is how you win. So, uh, you know, we, we always give out engagement prizes at the end. So far, uh, Tracy's chiming in. Uh, Percy the guinea pig. He's a Neapolitan. I, I thought Neapolitan oh. was an ice cream. I have no <laughs> idea what that means. Uh, Shirley says uh, T-Rex, her miniature schnauzer. <laughs> Awesome. I really thought she meant T-Rex, and I was like, you had a dinosaur as a pet? I'm confused. Did you see, you. Not see Jurassic World? It's like real. So like, <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. She did, though. And uh, De <laughs> Debbie's got her kitty cats, Steve and Kia. Kia. And then Nancy, hey, Nancy, good to see you in here. Let's see, Doobie the Gray Czech Parakeet. <laughs> <laughs> Doobie, that's a good name. I know. <laughs> Especially since I was just at the cannabis conference. Uh, and, <laughs> and then uh, Jackson, how about you? Um, I don't know. Probably uh, the cat we have now, Nala. Yeah. She's cute. The 
It's just so adorable. My, uh, she does I, like I, little things like sleep with like her paws over her eyes and stuff like yeah. that. So cute. Isn't it funny? I don't. It's like a, it's like a what? Like a some crazy, like multiple billion dollar industry. It's like interesting how. And and I always laugh, especially since you've moved to the city, Kate. It almost seems like the animals are walking the people. Do you notice that? It's like oh yeah, in control. You know, there's like this secret society, and I watch some of the the movies with animals. So anyway, as we digress, you know, it just feels like yeah, I think they might be in control of us. So <laughs> my right, honor so. for sure. So thank you everybody for playing along. We always like to find something social out about each other. And remember, this is the key to your social success and your influencerness in the world is uh, making sure that you understand your audience and what's important to them and what they're about, as well as making sure you're transparent about what you're about, as long as it's legal. Uh, so Social Jack members, uh, don't forget, you can log into the Academy and pick up all kinds of resources, I don't know, about three or 400 classes and broadcasts and uh, uh, tools out there. We have tons of forms. Kate and I are reworking the influencer course uh, that we're going to be delivering here in Chicago and the one that we spoke about last few weeks where we're launching. It. We're going to start uh, in Asia with Malaysia uh, and then we're going to go across and uh, down to I think um, Australia down under, so we're going uh, going all over the place with this thing, so it's cool. But make sure you uh, keep logging in and stay tuned because Kate's been and her team have been delivering these, uh, developing these great worksheets on the event influencer stuff. Jackson's been coming up with some great uh, tip sheets and worksheets. So all that stuff is in here. So you just log in, click on docs and pick those things up. So there's no limit to the resources that you have in there. Uh, also discount codes to the upcoming events that we're gonna talk about next. So we have the event influencer marketing to fill your ev uh, next event. Oh my gosh, that's tomorrow morning already. Uh, Thursday, <laughs> September 13th at 11 a.m. Central Time. Now, those of you that are regular subscribers and the people that are on today, we automatically are putting you into that class so that you can get the uh, kit, you can get everything, the recording, even if you can't attend. Uh, we have a pretty full class for tomorrow, but we want to make sure that you get in there. Uh, those members, uh, Jackson, talk to Joe. I did uh, talk to him about that a little bit, but let's go ahead and put the rest of those members in there too that didn't make it live today. Um, also, uh, how to rock your personal brand. That is Thursday, September 27th at 11 a.m. Uh, you guys will be included in that. Please invite your friends to these too. These are really good to have conversations with your network to help increase your thought leadership and awareness. Very cool things. And then how to convert LinkedIn connections to clients, five steps to monetize your network. After all, it's great to be an influencer, but it's also great to get paid, right, Kate? I, I like it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. And then we have uh, for blockchain, we are... Uh, proud media sponsors for the Blockchain Summit here in Chicago coming up on Friday, October 19th. It's an all-day event. If you need tickets, um, please get to us immediately because those tickets are selling out fast. They have virtual tickets for sale, too. Uh, we are handling the streaming part of this and everything else. There's about 500 people expected. Uh, so if you want to get access to this, please let us know. Oh, and then our course that you guys uh, are on the waiting list for, a lot of you, uh, we already have this thing, I think, half filled, the Chicago Workshop and Networking Event, How to Be a Business Influencer, uh, Thursday, October 25th, uh, from 1 to 7 p.m. It's a great workshop. You will leave being an influencer. Trust me, it's super awesome. All right. Woo, we got a lot of events coming up, uh, rounding out the year here. Okay, so... Let's see. Uh, so first article we have or news article we have today is seven research back notes on how brands can build trust. Yeah, so um, I'll cover this one. And I love how they said research backed because, um, you know, we're over here saying all the time how we're trying to make social media social again, bring those conversations. But these are actually real case studies of how you can do it successfully. So I urge you to check out the link in the follow up email. But just to touch on a couple things. Um, the first one is that social media is a key for building emotional connection. So kind of the thing that we also do on the webinar when we ask those questions, you can bring 
things like that to social media. Use the polling tools, use um, images, use stories, use the live stories, use like Instagram stories, find different ways to bring that connection to your consumers online because that's how you're going to make loyal clients, um, people that, you know, will buy your brand for life. Um, Speaking of which, you know, social media is the best way for people to fall in and out of love with brands. We yeah. see it all the time. We see companies with dynamic social media presences. We see people like Wendy's who troll people on Twitter, you know, people that have these just dynamic presences and that makes you want to or not want to do business with them. Just like when people click on your LinkedIn and they decide if they want to do business with you, they can do the same for your social media for a company. So keeping that in mind, that that's kind of make or break. And then almost most importantly is using social media to deliver customer service. Um, if you have yeah. a question, if you have a problem, if you just leave a comment, we saw this all the time at the theme park. We were constantly answering questions on social media that people had, whether it's just something they could find on the website or not. We were always responsive to those questions and we see other companies, um, companies that we're affiliated with, even Disney World who weren't as responsive responsive and we got fantastic feedback people saying this is why we'll continue to come back because you guys have great customer service on your social media so even if you're a smaller company it's something you can do so kate uh, miriam asks what do you mean by a troll on twitter what does that mean um, so a troll is like somebody who gives you crap on twitter basically so um Wendy's is a great example of this that I know in the news, but there's been some other companies where somebody would tweet something mean to Wendy's and they basically had a response for everything. And so this is their personal brand and how they were working it in um, and responding to all these tweets. But for some people, it was the make or break. Like, I will buy Wendy's because of how they responded on Twitter now. So, wow. So uh, so they just go toe to toe with them. Yeah, they do. And I don't suggest that for smaller <laughs> Unless brands. Unless you have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suggest that for the smaller brands, but it's just an interesting example of how Wendy's really made their social media presence not only represent their brand, but stick out from the rest to where I know people who have been talking about it and saying, I'm going to go to Wendy's because of how they act on social media. So. Yeah, and I just want to call out, I've been saying this forever is uh, brand conversations more persuasive than advertising? And I know we run a lot of advertising, but once you get people in or drawing close to you, you must talk with them. That's why we're in the influencer event business. Every platform is an event, right, Kate? Do I say that enough? I, say, I think I say that 10 times a day. No, never enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Twitter rolls out another thing here. I know we covered Instagram a few times, but audio only live streams on Twitter and Periscope. This has got to be Jackson's area, right? So Yeah, this is super cool. So basically, in a world of podcasts, Twitter is catching up. They want you to be able to stream live directly to your uh, followers, which I think is super cool since it's audio only. And if you scroll down a little bit, they tweeted it out uh, saying, you know, sometimes you just want to talk without being on camera. And there's yeah. so many people that, you know, we know that run into that where they're like, well, I'm not really big into being on camera. Well, this is perfect for those people because they still want to get their message out and they can stream it right to their followers. The only downside that I see with this is it's through Periscope and Twitter. And that's another thing is Periscope is dead kind of yeah it's it's an expired uh outdated platform uh, th th this is going to be something where they can you know try and make it better but still people have that stigma in their head that periscope's dead why go to periscope when you have all these other platforms so uh, how, how uh, what were you saying no, well, uh, so, um, you know, because I, I was a big Periscope user and then, of course, everything else took over. But my question is, is this going to be something that if I'm only on Twitter, I see or do I have to have the Periscope app to have this engaged properly? Uh, you could pro I, I believe you can have it on Twitter because they're saying through Periscope and Twitter. Right. right. So I, I believe that's 
That's I think they'll be more. Su- I think they'll be more successful that way. So, all right. Yeah, well, and actually, for right now, they're only rolling out uh, on iOS. So Android will be, you know, later in the year, but still soon to come. So definitely very cool. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, as always, we'll send this news out. And Shirley Miller says this is what she's been waiting for. So she's excited about this whole new thing uh, for sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, and she says Android, She's gonna. they're going to save the best for last. So uh, there you go. So, uh, all right. So with that being said, let's have a quick poll here. I would like to know because we have all these classes coming up, but I want to make sure if you are not on the waiting list, you are on the waiting list because we're processing that this week uh, for these upcoming classes. And then we're going to let Kate and Jackson get to the busy on their stuff and uh, get ready to bring Corey on here. So real quick answer to this question, put me out of the waiting list for social streaming, influencer development, marketing, personal branding and storytelling, or our upcoming social selling course. Ready, click. There you go. So it's going to be gone in 10 seconds. And real quick while you're clicking on that. So one of the influencer lessons here is measuring your success. Most of you downloaded the ROI calculator. It's pretty easy to get. Just go to Social Jack's website, log in, and uh, you'll definitely get the ROI calculator. But please, whether you're going to be an influencer for yourself or your business or your brand, you have to measure your success. Uh, step on the scale, whatever you want to call it, but please make sure that uh, as part of your website, you're looking at your analytics. What does your traffic look like? What does engagement look like for social media? Make sure you're measuring that. And at the very least, look at it every single week or have somebody in your organization look at it every single week. Super, super, super important. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, get ready for our guest here. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Corey Padveen. I've known him for uh, quite a few years now. He's grown up with uh, Bernie's Mountain Dogs. He's played... um, Uh, Junior level hockey, Uh, not currently, but he's played a a lot of hockey most of his life. Uh, He thinks of himself as a pretty good amateur chef. He did a TED Talk in Las Vegas and uh, collects antique shoehorns of all things (laughs) (laughs) and actually uh, wrote a uh, marketing book for millennials for dummies. Did I have that that title right? Yeah, it's uh, marketing to millennials for dummies. So about his... uh topical as you could possibly get when it comes to the for dummies <laughs> theories. I know. And you know, we, it's funny because we have, uh, we have millennials and now Gen Z. So, um, uh, so, you know, it's just, it, so you're going to have to write the next book on Gen Z. You realize that, right? Well, the, so, well, that's the, the funny thing about it is originally the whole idea was writing this book about um, the millennial mindset, the whole idea that, you know, it's not a question of whether you were born between a and b it's a question of how people think and how people conduct themselves in everyday life and uh then they just they were they asked if we wanted to do it uh, as a for dummy series instead and then they asked me if i could do it as marketing to millennials because that's an easier title to sell and i said well (laughs) sure (laughs) i'm not going to say no i mean (laughs) that's what you're asking for then that's absolutely what you're going to get but it's much more about you know the whole idea there is exactly you know what what you were just saying which is it's marketing to people today. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll just, and, we'll just uh, group them all together as a title and call it a day. And I'm and I'm gonna let you. Uh, I'm gonna let you. I, I'm gonna give you a quote for your next book on the Gen Z thing because you know there, there's gonna yeah. be something cool about that. So, uh, so Gen Zs were all born with devices in their hand basically, right? Because millennials still were in that transition period. So Gen Z were all were born. So we say they're swiping before they're wiping. Right. So that's, <laughs> that's right. I see it as I see it as a tagline right now. Swiping before wiping. You can have you that. I, I guide to marketing to Gen Z. So there you go. So I know we're going to be talking about blockchain and marketing, but can you I, I mean, I was fascinated by this. So uh, I did order it. So my my question is, well, thank you. a couple of nuggets out of here, because I'm just like I was like, wow. OK, so so what do you what's some of the things sure. that you tell people? Uh, you know, the I think that a couple of the biggest points that really are of note, you know, a, a big part of the book is really focused on strategy, right? So it's really building, it is it is a for dummies book, so it is very methodical, it is very, uh, very focused on structure. Uh, and at its core, you know, the one of the things that they advise when they're talking, when they're telling you about writing these books is that the purpose of a for dummies book is that you should be able to jump to 
any section without having to worry about other sections. You know, when you're talking about how to, you know, when you're looking at, uh, let's say, woodworking for dummies, you could be going to a section about building a crib and you can go to another one about building stairs and right. you won't necessarily need any of the uh, any of the other chapters. It's not necessarily linear. Uh, the one thing here though, is that the focus that I really tried to highlight is that this is really about data. I mean, you know, my background is in econometrics. Uh, most of the work that we do is based in, uh, is based in data, based in data centric strategy. So the focus really is on using data as your, your, let's say your foothold in building out your whole strategy. So that's really one, one area is that the amount of data that's available. And I think, you know, Dean, we've talked about this a lot is that the amount of data that's available, the amount of information that you can gather, whether it's through simply asking people, which people don't give enough credit to, uh, or the focus on uh, collecting data that's out there, taking this raw data and structuring it however you need it, that's something that doesn't get enough uh, credit uh, for. So that's really an area of focus. And then the second one to some of the events that you have been talking about, uh, trust and relationships are crucial to absolutely anything that you're going to do. This is a generation that, you know, like you, that stat you just pointed out, people are much more interested in having a conversation than they are in seeing an ad. I mean, you see the dips, you know, last year, I think was the first time in 20 some, 30 some years that uh, ads for the Super Bowl were less than they were for per 30 yeah. second spot in the year before. Uh, you look at every single one of the ads, you know, it was 2004, uh, or 2006, Audi was the first brand to use a hashtag in their commercial. And last year, 100% of brands had a hashtag because the whole point was about maintaining conversation, building trust, going outside of the ad. And, and, so didn't, really um, and, and, didn't, uh, and didn't Doritos or somebody break the mold like two years ago because of millennials? Yeah, which, uh, they started on social media, the ads, didn't yeah, they? with the whole yeah. UGC campaign. So right. it was create the 30 second spot. If you win, you get a million dollars and I guess a lifetime supply of Doritos or whatever it was. And <laughs> then we'll buy the ad spot. And you'll be featured on, on, in the Super Bowl. Right. But I mean, that's, you know, so it's really about relationships and building that rapport over spending huge dollars on advertising to beat the competition. You know, this isn't the Mad Men era as much fun as that show made it look. This is much more about cultivating relationships, getting more personal, building that trust because, you know, the, one of the uh, one of the points in there about about consumer trust, but it's every year Edelman puts out their trust barometer, and you know ninety ninety plus percent of people trust a peer over the over a brand. So it's you know it's really more about trust in and in that relationship than it is about who can spend the most, who has the best looking brand. Not that that's not important, but it's certainly not the most important. So this is a big focus of the book is on how to build those relationships. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, this just popped into my head, but I'm thinking, um, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, we've all heard the boiling the frog component of of marketing and and subliminal advertising and commercials. And we've grown up with this just things coming at us from all directions, you know, and and so my my thought is I think millennials actually actually gave us that aha moment that said, hey, we're tired of being sold to, you know, we want to, we want to be buyers. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think one of the, one of the better examples of that, I, and that ads coming at you in every which way, uh, you're talking about 1976, the average, uh, the average consumer was shown about 500 brand images on a daily basis by daily. 2000, that's 76. Right. By 2000, the study found that and now these are brand images. These aren't ads, but you know, I, I, I'm sitting at my computer right now and I have 25 different brands that I'm looking at, which are being shown. The average consumer in 2015, I think it was, sees a little over 5,000 a day. So we are, I mean, we're completely numb to what we're seeing. And that numbness means that you need to figure out something that, set, that set, uh, sets you apart. So you look at Tom's shoes, you know, one of the case studies in the book is I talk about Tom's shoes. Tom's has built this huge following with a millennial base of consumers because they make it very clear. Yeah, our shoes cost $65, but the shoe itself is worth $32.50. And the other $32.50 is for another pair that's going to go to someone who doesn't have them. Right. And that resonates really well because it's not just Tom's made well and you could walk around in them like other shoes. Now, I'm not one to talk. I have 
well, for every shoe horn I have, I have a pair of shoes to go with it. <laughs> but, 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 you know, Tom's has done a great job of really highlighting the need to separate yourself on a more personal level than to just have a better product because products are indistinguishable in a lot of cases for a lot of consumers. So you need to be doing something a little differently. Yeah. And, you know, I've been, uh, was, you know, I've been in uh, the B2B side of marketing forever. I mean, we do have some consumer brands, but they're tied to B2B initiatives. So more B2E sure. or, or blended or two sides of the equation. But uh, what's interesting is, is I've only ever worked on campaigns that are value based. That's where we get all of our education. That's why I built social Jack, because I'm like, we're going to teach people, we're going to, you know, generate trust and then, yeah. and then draw people in. And that's the only type of things we work on. And I think, I think we're in that mode now where people are getting that. Do you see more of that on your side? Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the exact to exactly that point value added needs to be the central focus of anything that you're doing. I mean, we, uh, in, in a given second, I could scroll through hundreds and hundreds of pieces of content and give almost none of them a second thought. So unless you're going to be providing me with some sort of value, whether it's in your content, whether it's in your product, whether it's in your, your overall marketing strategy and mission, uh, and that value can be, I mean, it can be intrinsic. It could just be me feeling good because when I bought this product, I knew that part of it was going to help somebody who didn't have something. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be something that is value in that I'm learning. I know I get something more out of it. You know, you see these content campaigns that are focused on, let's say, insider information or behind the scenes. Right. These are the kinds of pieces of content that people people are willing to pay for. You know, I people pay for subscriptions because they get access to, uh, let's say, uh, access to early bird tickets or they get access to uh, first, you know, first run of uh, of a print or of a, a video or whatever it might be because people like being in that inner circle and that's value that people have or that's value that's added from from that form of payment so you know just that that very transactional relationship between brands and consumers is sort of evolving it still exists but on a much more let's say primal level that I will go to a store and I will buy food because I need to eat to live but when I'm going to a restaurant I'm you know, you see these affordable or these uh, farm to table experiences and these more affordable set menu experiences. Um, those have become much more in fashion because again, there's a value being added to the overall experience where I'm not just paying for the quality of the food and uh, the food that I'm eating, but I'm also paying for the surrounding experience, the environment, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Uh, since you're a data guy, I'm going to transition and sh I'm going to shoehorn a question in here. Do you mind that? Uh, that's no problem. You see what, you see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> it all comes together. It's nice yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so you look at a lot of data. You're like me. You and I are like scientists when it comes to data. We get a little bit Always. fanatical. We love our dashboards and analytics. And you and I met talking analytics uh, over a few cocktails at SMSS like I don't know, a long time ago. So, uh, so my, uh, my, my question is, there's a lot of content today. And Kate listening in, a lot of our audience, we generate a lot of content. And it's really, are we valuable? Are we newsworthy? Are we connecting to our audience and all that? Um, do you think we're, we're hitting or are we, are we doomed to hit a saturation point? And, and what are you seeing around that? You know? Yeah, I think, uh, in the same way, so one of the things that uh, I don't think gets or doesn't get given enough attention is the fact that we went from radio for about 150 years to uh, television for about 60 to, I mean, we're talking about a, a an exponential growth in term or an exponential uh, evolution, right? So we're talking, you know, following Moore's law of, of transistors on a, on a chip, we're talking about this hyper exponentially increase rate of evolution so, <clears throat> so we're talking about 2004 facebook pops in pops up as a comparison tool at harvard and fast forward 10 years and it's a fortune 100 company fast forward five years after that it is one of the it's one of the five most valuable companies on the planet so there's this rate of growth and in that at that same time part of what has made it so valuable is the amount of information the amount of content that's in there at 
the same rate that content in there has grown, we've sort of grown weary of content, which is why you saw things like uh, going from blogs to images and videos to podcasts to video podcasts to things just like this becoming much more popular because the desire to digest content is still there. The amount of content is overwhelming. So we're looking to digest it in the shortest time frame in the simplest way possible. In terms of a saturation point, I kind of feel like we are either at it or we've already passed it because the more and more you're starting to see this realization on the part of brands, on the part of marketers that you don't need to be posting five blog articles a day and posting to your social channels 650 times a day and tweeting every second of every day. It's much more about, you know, going back to what we said, it's much more about showcasing value, sharing something right. that is worthwhile as opposed to just sharing to get your content out there. And that's why, you know, we've worked with the number of clients and I'm sure you have too, who have said, uh, should we be jumping onto this network? And we'll look at them and say, look, unless you're really will the, that the time to build massive audiences overnight is gone and it right. is not coming back. And unless you are really going to be providing some sort of useful value to that network, unless you really have a content strategy that is going to be of any additional value to a new audience with that network, just because you heard about Snapchat from your from your granddaughter or from your friend's niece doesn't mean that Snapchat's going to be of value to what you're doing because you're we're no longer in that era where just being somewhere is going to cultivate a following overnight. Right. So that's why I kind of feel like we've hit that tipping point where brands and consumers are starting to realize just because you can doesn't mean you should, which I think is a really good thing from a marketing standpoint, from an advertising standpoint. Uh, but there's still, you know, for as many people who have figured that out, there's still just as many that are not there yet, whether it's because they're, this is just isn't the world they live in or it's because they're still trying to make something happen. Um, that's, you know, that remains to be seen, but I kind of feel like that saturation point's been hit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you said that. And Kate's probably ha has a sigh of relief on the other side. Um, <laughs> in turn, well, she has a whole team that generates content and posts and things like that. And sometimes, you know, it's not about the, it's not about the five posts a week or the, like you said, the five, you know, tweets a day or whatever it is, it's, it's almost to the point where, okay, let's take a step back. Let's pause. You know, we just hit, we actually just had a pause session last week where we're like, when you're done with a content calendar pause and, and feel as if you would connect to that content, like, would you have a right. conversation with this content? And, and, and I think we're at that stage of, uh, not just cranking out, like you said, 200 blogs, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. But it's really about taking time to understand what people need, what they want, and uh, having a conversation about that, you know? Agreed. And and not going, you know, understanding specifically what your audience needs and wants. Because, you know, I, I personally, I am a different character on LinkedIn than I am on Facebook, than I am on Twitter, than I am yeah. on Instagram. And my expectations as a consumer of content and products on each one of those networks is completely different. So you, it's a, you need to understand, like like I like you were saying, take that second and take a step back. Is this an article that's just being written for the sake of getting a new piece of content up, or is this an article that's been written because you actually want to engage with people, you want to give your two cents, you want to showcase your let's say individuality or your opinions on something? Um, that's that's a much more valuable process than just having a room full of writers going at typewriters all day long. <laughs> right. So uh, <laughs> so so Jackson, mark this segment because we're going to play it in Friday's meeting. Because if Corey says it, even though we say it every week, it's going to sound different than than, us <laughs> say, than Kate and I repeating it every week. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that works. goes. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> all right. I'm going to shoehorn some blockchain in here. Is that cool? <laughs> Let's do that. We're almost out, though, of shoehorns. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. How did you get started? Okay, have... No, give uh, me like the, it... the short version of that. Right? I'll give you the, the, uh, so uh, my, my grandfather had a an antique shoehorn um, that when he moved – uh, when he moved out of his out of his home, he basically didn't have enough room for everything that he was taking. And among those things was this antique shoehorn that I remember when I was a kid, I had always, you know, I'd always played with, not realizing I was holding this this antique handcrafted 
uh, bamboo shoehorn. And uh, I, I got that and I thought to myself, this is pretty cool. And then um, I found myself having bought one uh, that from a street vendor one time and all, and then I was, uh, I was at, the, I found, stumbled into this estate auction online and I bought one there. Wow. And all of a sudden I found myself having this small collection and I said, this seems like, this is the kind of thing an eccentric billionaire would connect with. <laughs> like. So, so you're setting yourself up first. <laughs> exactly. So now I could either be this, you know, old basement dweller with no money and a collection of shoehorns, or I could be someone successful with a bunch of antique shoehorns on a wall. So it's going to be either hoarder or success, but I need to go one of those two directions now. I don't I have a middle ground. <laughs> I love it. So, uh, so awesome. So, so with blockchain, right? Because you just saw that I popped up that we're streaming a big blockchain event coming up here in Chicago. Sure. So, so for everybody that's out here, and most of us are marketers that are listening in or business owners that, that want to figure out their influence and all that good stuff. What, what is blockchain like in the simplest form? Sure. So I guess the, the simplest way of, of explaining it would be a transfer of data in a decentralized uh, in a decentralized community whereby every single member of the community, or in this particular case, let's call it a, a ledger, a distributed ledger, where everybody's responsible for overseeing and verifying the, or through a tech, everybody through the technological structure is individually and independently responsible for verifying that the transaction is approved. So for example, uh, you know, when a collection of transactions takes place, those are taking place within, and a transaction, it can be, uh, it can be a purchase, it can be a transfer of data, it could be uh, the filing of a contract, whatever it might be, all of those transactions have little data points that are distributed among all members of the system. Now you don't necessarily you don't necessarily know that you are a member of the system. It's simply that by working on the blockchain, which is again a technological structure built into computer systems, built into algorithms, as a member of that uh, set of transactions, you are responsible for making sure that the next set of transactions is not altering the previous set. So that's, that's where the chain part comes in, in terms of verifying and validating what takes place. And then those all get stored. So each one of those transaction sets is called a block, uh, or in, if we're putting it into the context of why it's called this, every set of transactions that is stored in a ledger is called, is, is the block. And every next set of transactions that has to be verified by the previous set of transactions is what makes up the chain. Uh, that's a very simple way of, <laughs> of explaining it. Uh, there's a lot more to it, and I don't pretend to know exactly every single in and out of it because I'm not a coder. Uh, I am a marketer who is trying to understand it from a much more practical standpoint. Right. Um, because I know that when you talk to coders about blockchain, they will talk to you as if you've been coding for 40 years and all you've done is write code to build on the blockchain. Uh, so <laughs> I've always tried to take that and try and make it into human speak so that people can understand what this is and how this isn't just about the things you see on the news when it comes to things like Bitcoin. I was going to say, and it has, it's, it's not really the same thing as Bitcoin, right? So the, where the market's going up and down. So, um, yeah. So, you know, Bitcoin is a speculative asset. Bitcoin is no different than uh, gold, you know, gold, uh, maybe it's more volatile, but again, it is a speculative asset that is unpegged to any form of traditional currency. So it is worth as much as the next person is willing to pay for it. Right. Uh, that can balloon into what we saw last December at $19,000. Uh, and it can collapse into by the 60, 70% that it's collapsed in the last 11 or last eight months. So that's it. It may be built on the blockchain from a technological standpoint, but it and the blockchain are, I mean, there's a, there's a, they're not mutually exclusive. They can, they right. can work independent of one another. So, so as marketers, as generating new business for ourselves, how do you see blockchain affecting marketing? You know, do you see it? Do you see it now, or is this like a futuristic thing? So, I mean, best estimates would say anywhere from five to ten years before you really see an impact. Uh, that could be longer because you may have companies like Google and Facebook getting in the way. Because one of the areas where blockchain has the potential to be the most impactful is in 
uh, ad buy-in. So one of the most common applications of blockchain, uh, modern current applications of blockchain is in the use of what's called smart contracts, which are essentially the use of a, uh, a virtual token or a cryptocurrency, which is exchanged through the, uh, through the completion of services that have been agreed upon in one of these contracts, which means if you and I enter into a contract where I say that I'm going to deliver on, uh, let's say 10 coding, uh, coding uh, goals, every time that I uh, hit one of those commits, you would be then responsible for paying me X dollars in uh, this currency or in this virtual token. That would take place on its own based on the existence of the blockchain so that if I hit all these commits and you owe me, let's say, let's say I have 10 things to do, you owe me a hundred dollars. I can't, I wouldn't have to go chasing after you. It's that I would hit one, $10 worth of this token would transfer over to me. And all of this would take place again in this distributed ledger, whereby everyone who's responsible could say, yes, the commit was delivered. It passed the test. Yes. The, currency is there, it'll be transferred. And all of this is done in a sort of pseudo escrow environment. Um, so so wait a is... minute. So, so wait a minute. Does that mean that that if I'm paying for apps with impressions and clicks, I would le legitimately see that it's real? Yes. Wow. So that's one of the that's one of the big, big areas. You know, we, you, you mentioned influencer marketing uh, earlier in some of the events right. that you're working on and some of the things that you uh, that you coach. Influencer marketing would be dramatically changed because, for example, one of the big issues when it comes to affiliate marketing, you know, we, we own an affiliate network and one of the big areas that we have really tried to, to distinguish ourselves is instead of having one of these huge networks with thousands and thousands of offers uh, and hundreds of thousands of, of affiliates who may be offering up uh, fraudulent clicks, who may be, you know, using you know, uh, click farms, things like that, click farms we're going theoretically here because things will always black and gray markets will always find a way to exist. Right. But things like click farms can theoretically disappear. Uh, things like fraudulent clicks, affiliate fraud, marketing, uh, these kinds of uh, influence campaign fraud, these, these things would can ultimately disappear because the existence of things like smart contracts and things like the blockchain would require transparent verification of every single event that takes place. Now these events would be taking place at scale, but that sort of transparent verification would mean that if I have a VPN that's bouncing from uh, one city to the next and doing 25 clicks at different IPs in every one of those cities, this is detectable in these kinds of processes and would not be a verified transaction. Yeah, that's so that's, that's a huge, huge win for the marketing industry. Uh, where you would have, let's say, problems is in the fact that the exist the very existence of a, a new market means that you have tons of involved in marketing these marketing tools would be extremely. I mean, you're talking about you've already seen it. You're seeing fraudulent campaigns, you're seeing huge amounts of cryptocurrency uh, 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 ICOs, initial coin offerings, where you're seeing huge theft. Uh, but the potential for the technology is great. It just needs to be applied at scale. It needs to be applied properly. Yeah. So that would mean that, um, I mean, do you see, do you see like, uh, or you, you may not even need it. I was just thinking, well, you know, because I at, at a period of my life, I worked in like audit of data. So it's like, you know, right. somebody's verifying, but it's almost like the blockchain itself is verifying and auditing, right? Yes. So that's that's a hundred. That's a perfect way of putting it is that yeah. uh, the auditing process, the verification process uh, is being done by the existence of the technology. So you're talking about a huge middleman operation and the middleman operation, by the way, is why the thing, something like ad buying and ad placement, uh, you could be looking at the death of media buyers. You could be looking. So there are downsides to wow. this because when you are talking about what you're looking for in terms of results and what your uh, spend is, this is a process whereby delivery can be done and verified without somebody going in, taking 30%, placing the ads, taking, and you could be talking about a pretty significant 
dip in the need for media buyers through an automated blockchain-based ad buying process or an affiliate placement process. So there's there's a lot of middle ground that is wiped away because of technology, but automation technology and the death of industry is nothing new. I mean, that's you, you look at any industrial revolution and that's exactly how it happens. <laughs> right, exactly. It's moving faster and faster. Uh, have you, yeah. uh, did you see the uh, social network called Minds, M-I-N-D-S, Minds.com? No. Ch check that out. We're taking a look. Yeah, it's the first uh, social network. Uh, our guy, Joe, just found it and turned us on to it. But it's it's growing at a faster rate than Facebook. But it's the first blockchain-based uh, and token-based uh, social network. So this is where I think things are going, where there's not like a Google or a Facebook or some enterprise that's owning what sure. you do and how you're doing things. And I think that's what you're saying here is like, we're going to see this whole shift and I don't think it's going to be as long as we think it is. I think it's, you know, it, well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, who knows, but, but these big companies while they're doing it, I think there's a lot of entre entrepreneurial people going, Hey, I'm going to eliminate this, this fortune 500. And I'm going to do this thing. There, I, and I, I agree with you that there, there is the thing about uh, decentralization is that all it takes is one major government to say no. Uh, you know, one of the big reasons why you saw this huge collapse in crypto is because governments in South Korea, governments in Japan, and governments yep. and, oh, yeah. threat, and governments in Hong Kong all said, uh, all put either huge restrictions or flat out banned cryptocurrency exchange. And when that happens, the market is kind of left in this no man's land. I know that you know uh, Bitcoin mining has moved very heavily. You know, I'm based here in Montreal. Bitcoin mining moved very heavily into the Quebec market for two reasons. One, uh, the climate here and the fact that it's powered entirely by hydro energy means that the energy uh, prices are really much better than they are in a lot of other places. Here in Washington state actually have the two best um, geographical makeups for, for Bitcoin mining and crypto mining. But one of the other reasons is because a lot of uh, particularly Asian markets where there's been a much heavier crackdown because of fraud on cryptocurrencies uh, and this that kind of use of blockchain, they've had to move their operations significantly. And if you have any sort of a, you know, let's say a World Trade Organization uh, that says, makes any sort of declaration about cryptocurrency or blockchain or any of these things, it's great to have these, the problem that you saw with um a lot of with some other emerging markets, you know, let's take a look at uh, online gambling in the United States. Right. There was a very quick jump to make it illegal. What ended up happening when you look back over the last 12 years, 15 years, is that that jump to basically blacklist all online gambling operations in the United States has led to a loss of hundreds of billions of dollars of tax revenue. So nobody's going to jump the gun and make anything flat out illegal or block out any sort of blockchain operation. And at the same time, any block, but any blockchain operation that's working to disrupt a major multi-billion dollar, in some cases, multi-trillion dollar yeah. industry is really going to have to tread carefully in how they do it because companies like Google and Facebook, even though, you know, they may, they may seem to be at the bend, bend to the will of right. the people, they we it's it's their world and we live in it so basically all facebook has to say you know you look at um things like ad blockers on uh on browsers all it takes is for companies like facebook companies like google companies like uh, forbes is one of my favorite examples forbes which is a huge hugely traffic site put up a uh a, an ad blocker blocker so you couldn't access the article you were trying to read unless you turned off your ad blocker and I mean, they, that's, that's how, that's their version of a paywall. And all it takes is for these major media companies to say, we don't like what's happening with blockchain because we're not doing it first and it can shut a lot of these things down. So it needs to, that's why, you know, when I say five to 10 years is because while these things may happen quickly, they also need to happen intelligently so that they don't get, you know, this, they don't hit this wall. Right. No, that's that's funny. And, you know, it's um, you know how marketing works. So somebody was just telling me uh, we're in a big collaborative tech space here. 
And uh, I was talking to a couple of the tech guys and telling them we're going to be talking about blockchain. And one of the young guys looks up and he goes, yeah, did you hear about Yummy Yogurt? And I go, no. He goes, yeah, they changed their name to Yummy Blockchain. Yeah. And they sold for like I don't know some ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, they they did. I mean, but and that was the I remember seeing that it was it was so it, they they just put in it was I think a forty percent bump in their in their value in their valuation when they added the word blockchain in there. There was also uh you know Kodak I'm sure I, I, I'm not sure if you saw Kodak announced not too long after that actually that they were moving Kodak the camera company. Uh, announced that they were going to be moving to uh, to a blockchain model, and their stock jumped 30%. Uh, I also saw the um, who was it? There was someone else recently. Oh, uh, oh, uh, Overstock.com is That's basically right. a cryptocurrency company now. Uh, the <laughs> but you know the, one of the things, and here's a perfect example of uh, practical applications. Uh, Kodak is right. while they are a camera company they also do have photographers and they do have a library of photos one of the big problems especially with the internet the way it operates is uh some people do get their shutterstock license and they buy photos and there are photographers who get their um who, who get their uh, residuals and who get their royalties most don't and i mean mo you go you go to almost any blog on on the on the web and the picture you're seeing there was just dragged and dropped from wherever it was that someone found it on google and it's being used kodak's use of blockchain is kind of creating an environment whereby the existence of the blockchain and the existence of a pegged cryptocurrency the kodak coin which is going to be used as a means of exchange will allow any use of a picture within their library built in this blockchain by anyone who drag even if they drag and drop it anybody using one of these images will be using it under a license that is verified by everybody who is a part of it and the royalties however small or large they may be will be going back to the artist in question which is the perfect example of how powerful blockchain can be in fixing things uh, am I going to sit here and pretend that it's a miracle? No, but it has a lot of significant power to better industries that apply it properly uh, when they're not just looking at it from the perspective of Bitcoin and blockchain are the same and that's all there is. Yeah. So there's well, there are some really cool practical applications to it. Well, that's like the social network. So basically, if you're just engaging naturally, liking, commenting, um, doing things that are benefiting the community and, and really being social, you get these tokens and then you can like take the tokens and promote your posts or you can take the tokens and and uh buy stuff you could cash them out for bitcoin so it's like you know I'm like, I'm like what so i can like you, you know one I'm, cryptocurrency exchange it for another <laughs> cryptocurrency and then exchange that for cash maybe and then you could buy shoes and shoe horns right so <laughs> exactly like, yeah. add to the collection so you know of course my mind won't stop thinking about where the hell is all this going you know because it's like it's crazy man it's like yeah. uh, what's next you know yeah no, so, it's, uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a very fast evolving, uh, it's a very fast evolving space in terms of how it can be used. Where you know, very similar to three D printing, which everybody got really excited. Everybody thought that they were just going to start printing villages and you know, changing the world. Three D printing's best applications are in printing small valves for aorta replacements, and right. those don't yeah. get that doesn't get front page headline news because it's not something flashy and exciting. So when you stop hearing about blockchain, recognize that it's probably being used in the right way and in its most exciting way, which is really only exciting insofar as big changes are happening behind the scenes, as opposed to $19,000 cryptocurrencies being traded by everybody who can get their hands on them. Right. So, um... So we're as we're as we're beginning to wrap up here, uh, you know, uh, most people were chiming in because this is still a very foreign subject to a lot of people. Sure. You know, they're just trying to grasp it. Yeah. So then, um, who do you um, who do you follow? Who do you read that helps you sort of stay inspired, connected to all this stuff? Who do you who do you, you like? Know, I, I one of the really the only uh, the only blockchain based 
newsletter that I subscribe to is uh, a company called uh, Block Geeks. The reason why is because, so B-L-O-C-K-G-E-E-K-S. Uh, the reason why is because it is, it, it really is a forum for what's happening in the industry of blockchain specifically, as well as lessons about what it is, how it works, how it's applied in a number of different industries. So that's the newsletter that I follow. Uh, in terms of news, um, to be honest, you know, paying attention to any sort of mention of blockchain in major news outlets is worthwhile. So CNBC, Bloomberg always has really good stuff in there. Uh, the mentions for, I mean, Google alerts in general, uh, you know, you have the, the cryptocurrency um, blogs and the cryptocurrency news sites are good, but they're much more financially focused than they are tech focused. Uh, and because my interest lies much more in technical or technological applications uh, and practical applications, the crypto side isn't what interests me as much. Uh, but when when it comes to uh, you know, major news outlets, I find I find that Bloomberg is way more ahead than most when it comes to their discussions about yeah, right. uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency. So that's really where big well, let's say, let's call it breaking news. Uh, that's where I would get a good chunk of it. But it's really just a question of going out there and finding it because. You know, the oldest crypto conversations are a couple of years old at best. So nobody's really established their foothold as being the most, the preeminent focal point for all things blockchain and crypto based. Yeah, for sure, opinion. for sure. Um, so as we, uh, as we uh, you know, ask our audience, we always uh, I will ask this, like, are you a business influencer? So yourself, as you have, um, and we're going to bring Jackson and Kate back on, but as you have developed your influencer you've always been like a regular i don't want to call it a content machine has this been a natural thing for you or do you have any advice for people that are looking to increase their influence uh, of one small tip that you found useful for yourself uh i would say that the most useful thing that uh, i ever did was take an hour uh, and this was, you know, when I first started the company, this was not just by choice, but this was the rule of the day. Uh, this goes for pretty much everybody here is take an hour uh, at the beginning of every single day and just read, read everything you can. Watch the one minute video about something new. Uh, listen to the two minute discussion about something. Watch those little whiteboard videos on YouTube that talk you through how something works. That's the educating yourself for an hour a day is the most valuable thing you could do to become someone who knows more than everybody else because you are the one who sees everything that's out there before at the start of your day and that's really where a lot of the inspiration for writing articles comes out of that too so that's uh, th that's the best piece of, of advice I could give it's the best thing that I did for myself and I think it's one of the better things that we do here as a kind of our daily morning routine with everybody yeah, that's cool. And uh, Jimmy Z just said leaders are readers. Um, one, th <laughs> one thing I heard on the radio, I listen, I'm one of those few people that listen to the radio besides Kate, uh, is, <laughs> is uh, that uh, uh, they were saying that when you get when when this guy gets writer's block, it's a sports radio thing, but when he gets writer's block, he says he he plays a quick game of chess, even online, because it uses a part of your brain that just like is like erasing a whiteboard, which I've never heard before. And I was like, I oh, love that's, chess. So that's, I'm, that's my, that's, you know, that's my going to be my new try. I'm going to try that. So what the heck, but it, but it's so different. All of a sudden yeah. on social jack, there's hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of articles coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. About chess. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. So uh, Kate, Kate, what did you learn having Corey on? Um, well, I really like his tips for like reading every single morning. I don't think I'm as good at that, but I just really liked how he broke down and explained blockchain and how can it, it can affect marketing. Cause like Shirley said, it's Greek to her. Well, it's, it's Greek to me. It goes a little bit above my brain. So it must be your experience in writing like a millennials for dummies book. You know, you must know how to break it down really well for us. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's it, what's the, I think the funniest thing about that that process was a lot of the things that we take for granted every because we all work in marketing. One of the right. a lot of the things we take for granted every day in terms of you know when we say things like ROI, when we say say things like LTV for lifetime value, or we say things like CPC, uh, or uh, you know 
these are things that we take for granted. And the assumption that I needed to make for absolutely every single page I wrote was nobody knows what you're talking about. So explain it as if this is the first time anybody's hearing it. You know, it's kind of like yeah. that subreddit. Uh, explain it like I'm five, which is one right. of the best subreddits out there. Like that um, that's, you know, that's, that's, th that was the, the best process that came out of that writing was explain everything as if this is the first time anyone's ever heard it. Yeah, for sure. Jackson, you have a quick 15 second snap of what you learned. Yeah, I, I really liked uh, when he was talking about how in 2017 uh, users were exposed to like 500,000 brand images, but like you're so numb to it that you don't even realize because you're constantly being right. So that that was cool. And then also what he said about, you know, watching like a one to two minute video every day, constantly educating. Yeah. I, uh, I like that a lot. So I'm going to start yeah. doing that more. Absorbing. Right. For sure. And then uh, Jackson, do we have a, a Starbucks winner this week? Yes, we do. Uh, Nancy Reed. Nancy, congratulations. So remember, Nancy, yes, yes. So remember, Nancy, what you want to do is take something that you learned from today uh, and, and educate that person over a cup of coffee. And then, you know, mention Corey and, and maybe his book and, and maybe even the blockchain thing. It might be a decent conversation and spark some other things and ideas, but this will help stimulate not just the conversation, but you being a thought leader and sharing knowledge. So, uh, Corey, uh, we just love having you on. It's like always something fresh, yeah, something different, something new. Yeah. So, appreciate the heck out of you. And uh, well, I thank think you I, all very much. I think appreciate I passed this up. Yeah, we're going to have Greg uh, Michio uh, next week, uh, Internet Marketing for Small Companies. Going to talk about some more, a uh, little bit about uh, conversion optimization, which we all love to convert more, right, Corey? No matter what. That, that's always, yeah, <laughs> we that's work. the goal. <laughs> So, and then we want to encourage you to visit uh, Corey. So if they want to follow you, Corey, best place on social? Uh, I mean, you know, you just type my name into absolutely anything. I never went all too crazy with uh, changing things around. So if you look up Corey Padvin, it's at Corey Padvin on Twitter, on uh, Facebook, on Corey.Padvin on Facebook. But you know, you'll find me everywhere under that exact name or CoreyPadvin.com for my personal blog and T2 Marketing International or T2.Marketing for corporate one. Cool, cool, cool. Well, thank you so much again, and thank you to all of you listening out there. And uh, please pass the word that this is good stuff, and uh, Influence Factory is always helping you to build your influence. And with that being said, we will see you all online real soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.